Hello, everybody. I'm very glad to welcome you at this report, or maybe at this presentation. Um, this uh, work is dedicated to the socio-demographical risks of humanitarian disasters in tropical Africa, and we also try to uh, infer some means of their mitigation or prevention. So as uh, uh, I'm sure everybody in this room knows, the world has already passed its peak population growth rates, and uh, these rates have been slowing down for the past several decades. But the only exceptional region remaining is the region of tropical Africa, uh, where the population growth risks are at their highest in the world now, and they are actually growing at faster rates than they have ever been in the world in general. Uh, so, uh, because of these high population growth rates, um, we expect a huge increase in population in the uh, coming decades and indeed up to the end of the century. And this, on this slide you can see the population projections made by the United Nations Population Division. I'm sure everybody is acquainted with this population projection series. This is the medium projection series. Uh, and you can see that uh, it implies really a, a huge and enormous population increase. Uh, we added Russia just for comparison. So you see that, uh, for example, Tanzania will host like twice the population of Russia and Nigeria will host about uh, four times the population of Russia, which is really uh, incredible figures. And uh, this enormous population growth, growth makes us uh, pose a question uh, indeed, when the world as a whole was passing the same stage uh, of the demographic explosion, uh, it was uh, uh, strongly connected with the Malthusian trap and the escape from the Malthusian trap in the course of demographic transition. So uh, now, uh, observing these high rates of population growth in tropical Africa, we pose a question, uh, is, uh, are the Malthusian risks still relevant to this region? And uh, if so, uh, how threatening are they to the prospects of, so, uh, of socio-political stability in the region? Uh, for this sake, we compare two regions. We compare North Africa and East Africa. Uh, we can see that North African countries uh, uh, are greatly different from their East African counterparts. Uh, we take the indicator of average per capita food consumption uh, the data is taken from the World Bank, and uh, we, we can obviously see that uh, the, North, um, the majority of North African countries uh, made their escape from the Malthusian trap in the 1970s, where there was uh, a very rapid increase in the average per capita food, food consumption. Uh, whereas for the Eastern Afri East African countries, we can see no such increase, and indeed, the uh, food consumption has remained at surprisingly stable levels uh, ever since the 1970s or even the 1960s, the earliest uh, data point for which we have data. Now, uh, just to remember the uh, Malthusian scenario, uh, it is a scenario where the uh, production per capita and food consumption per capita do not increase in the long-term perspective because the uh, output of production uh, is outpaced by population growth. And this is indeed what we observe in, for example, in Kenya. Uh, to get this uh, figure, we took uh, the values of population and GDP for 1980 as 100% and measured the relative increase in population and GDP up to the end of 2000, uh, up to the 2008. Um, and we can really see that uh, GDP growth cannot outpace the population growth, and they have increased at pretty much the same rate uh, for these uh, three decades under, uh, under research. Uh, the situation is a little bit different in Uganda, where we can see uh, some in, uh, rather remarkable increase uh, in per capita GDP since, uh, say, 1990s. But the thing is that uh, uh, the economy of Uganda has been really on the rise. 
but most of the growth most of the growth has been concentrated in the non-agricultural sectors which employ only a very uh, minority of the people um, for example such as uh, communications construction manufacturing and other things like that uh, whereas agriculture which hosts uh, still the majority of the population of East African countries, you can see it here. So the value added per worker in agriculture has remained uh, pretty much stable in Uganda and even somewhat decreased in Kenya. Again, this is World Bank data. So uh, this means that this, the Malthusian concerns are very um, relevant, are very pressing for the uh, tropical African part of the world and we cannot say that the world has already outlived this threat because really the, some, element, some elements, not the whole multi scenario, but some of its, of its most important elements are still observed in some of the African countries as we have seen in the previous slides. Uh, undoubtedly, uh, uh, this is uh, to a great extent triggered uh, by the, demo the specific demographic trends of the African countries. So how is uh, tropical Africa and sub-Saharan Africa in general uh, different from uh, the rest of the world in terms of demography? Again, I'm sure that everybody knows that it's the most uh, lagging the region of the world in terms of completing its demographic transition, especially fertility transition. Uh, some uh, success, uh, some remarkable success has been achieved in combating infant and child mortality in the recent years. I will not uh, go into detail uh, in, into this topic uh, because of the lack of time. Uh, though of course, there remains a long way to go, but <clears throat> still the successes in combating the child and infant mortality have been rather mar remarkable. But what about fertility? What about fertility transition? Uh, it started in the uh, uh, like 70s or uh, 1980s, and it seemed to proceed rather smoothly and uh, in line with other regions of the world, but then uh, during the 1990s and, uh, a, uh, and a good part of the 2000s, uh, fertility uh, measured by total fertility rate uh, remained stalled. It did not decline, it, remained, it, gets, it got stalled at extremely high levels, more than five children per woman, which is considered a very high fertility. Uh, this unexpected stall uh, contributed greatly to the demographic explosion uh, about which I've been talking uh, a, few, a few slides earlier. And indeed, the United Nations Population Division had to update its projections and uh, uh, increase them very, very significantly. You can see uh, at these slides uh, the comparison of the projections made in the year 2000 and the projections and projection series made in the year 2012. So, for each country, there is a very significant increase in expected population growth, in projected population growth. So, why did this fertility stall happen? Uh, there can be no single answer to that. Uh, one of the most uh, widespread answers is that uh, in the 1990s, the priority of family planning was downgraded severely, partly due to the shifting uh, population policy agenda in the world, uh, partly due to the shift of interest of some major aid donors, uh, not uh, least because of the AIDS epidemic, uh, which uh, required huge number of, a huge amount of resources, uh, which, uh, could, which had to invariably be taken from uh, other spheres, including family planning. But what I would like to, uh, to pay your attention here uh, is uh, some of the socioeconomic mechanisms deeply embedded into the traditional life of tropical African societies. And in our opinion, these mechanisms contributed greatly to the tall fertility transition and to general sl uh, slowness of fertility <coughs> transition in this region. To start with, uh, 
tropical Africa uh, is tropical African societies are very different from societies of uh, other developing world, uh, of other developing regions of the world, in one particular aspect. In one particular aspect, uh, uh, they uh, were mostly involved in hoe agriculture, whereas the rest of the, uh, the rest of the world uh, had plow agriculture, um, or rather more widespread. Uh, for the sake of uh, being brief, I will not uh, go into details of how we tested this hypothesis. I will just say that we tested them on the Atlas of Murdoch, and each uh, arrow at this scheme found support uh, on the Murdoch data. Um, so, uh, how agriculture is associated with traditionally high female contribution to subsistence? Because in how agriculture, the woman is the main worker in the fields. While in plow agriculture, it's the, male, uh, it's the males who do the most of the agricultural work. So uh, while, uh, and actually it remains so even uh, up to these days, if you just uh, travel or do field work in, uh, for example, Eastern African countries such as Tanzania or Uganda or Kenya, you can see women in the fields, not, not men. It's, it's still to considered to be female work. So, a traditionally high female contribution to subsistence invariably arose uh, the uh, battle between a woman's uh, work life and her family life, such as uh, her, uh, t uh, her, the time which uh, she needed to raise her children, to take care of her children. And several mechanisms uh, got developed in, uh, in her agricultural societies. Uh, which allow, uh, allowed a woman to combine uh, her agricultural work with having many children. One of these uh, uh, mechanisms was large extended families, because in the extended family it's much easier for a woman to find a, <coughs> uh, a caretaker for her children. It may be a sister, it may be an aunt, uh, a cousin, uh, a sister-in-law, and so on. And the other mechanism is the prevalence of polygyny. Polygyny is indeed uh, associated with, uh, uh, again, whole agriculture and high female contribution to subsistence. Uh, and in polygynous households, uh, women uh, quite often take shifts to take care after their babies, after the, all, all the babies in the household, while, there are, while other women go to work in their fields. And these two mechanisms, uh, lead to a number of important consequences for population policies in tropical Africa. Uh, let's go uh, through them, uh, just how they are listed on the slide. First, modernization initially uh, leads to the fertility growth because of the uh, elimination of polygyny and of extended families. Then, uh, the low potential uh, for the increase in, in the birth spacing is, is likely to contribute to fertility decline. Is, unlike, is unlikely, sorry, to contribute to fertility decline. Then low potential for female labor participation growth, uh, which also is important, which served as an important uh, factor of fertility decline in other countries of the world, but uh, is unlikely to have uh, the same significant impact in tropical Africa just because the female labor participation has always been high. And the especially high ideal family size, which is also con uh, connected with the large extended families. So this means that uh, some of the uh, mechanisms uh, which worked well in the rest of the developing world, such as uh, modernization and increased female labor participation uh, with modernization, are likely to have a much milder effect on dec uh, decreasing effect on fertility in tropical Africa than they did in the rest of the world. So what can be done uh, with respect to uh, this? So how, uh, what population policies are likely to be successful in uh, re restoring, uh, restarting the tropical African fertility decline? Well, the factor number one is uh, for sure female education. Uh, it has been shown that female education uh, brings down both real fertility and the desired number of children, and uh, this is also true for the tropical Africa. So female education works well in this region uh, as well as it did in the rest of the world. 
uh, it works through a number of uh, uh, direct fertility determinants, such as more educated women tend to marry later, are more informed about contraception, have better access to contraception, and tend to use it more often and more effectively. But the thing is that uh, the primary education, the, uh, uh, that achieving the 100% uh, coverage uh, by primary education uh, is still uh, probably not sufficient to uh, bring fertility down uh, significantly. Uh, it worked rather well, for example, in Latin America, but uh, with all the uh, high fertility culture of tropical Africa, which, the mechanisms of which we discussed before, it is likely to only, so it's, uh, this is the correlation between TFR and the share of women aged 15 plus having at least incomplete primary education. And we can see that uh, even women with, uh, even the societies with a rather high female uh, incomplete primary education still tend to uh, have rather high fertility between uh, four and five or sometimes even six children per woman. But the picture is uh, strikingly different when we talk about secondary education. With secondary education, uh, this seems to be really the most powerful factor among uh, all the factors which we considered uh, that, uh, has, that is likely to have the most powerful impact upon fertility. So uh, our correlation shows that uh, even having about 70% of uh, women uh, in the society covered by at least incomplete secondary education is likely to bring the fertility rates down to the uh, replacement level. But, uh, uh, but uh, <coughs> the population problem in Africa is already very pressing while uh, female education uh, important as it be and necessary as it be, uh, still requires quite a lot of years to uh, bring this measure into practice. Because oh, we have seen from the experience of Africa with the Millennium Development Goals that uh, even uh, having uh, a decade and a half or even two decades uh, is still, is, for many societies, it was insufficient to bring the uh, primary education to the full coverage. So uh, some uh, faster acting policies are also needed. And here we come to the family planning factor. Uh, and in this respect, uh, of particular interest for us is the case of Rwanda. Because uh, during just five years from 2005 to 2010, Rwanda achieved a record fertility decline in the whole sub-Saharan region. Indeed, its fertility decline was one of the fastest in the world. It was comparable with Iran. Uh, you can see the figures. Uh, probably I'll just uh, skip <coughs> saying them. You can see them on the slide. So Rwanda and Tifar, uh, declined both among <coughs> urban women and rural women and among women with all levels of education. Uh, Rwanda success was based on a whole country government program uh, aimed at increasing family planning prevalence through the infrastructure of community-based health insurance schemes. schemes. Uh, it was as uh, late as 2007 that Rwandan president uh, set the goal of 70% contraception prevalence rate among married women. And in just five uh, years, uh, the total fertility rate uh, decreased by uh, nearly 1.5 children per woman. So uh, Rwanda seems to be really on a pretty good track and might serve as a, a successful example case for the other countries of the region. So indeed, it's comparative with, it's compar it can be compared to Iranian uh, rates of fertility decline in 1980s. So, uh, what uh, population scenarios do the African countries have lying in front of them? Uh, we have already seen the uh, United Nations population division scenarios at the very first slide, and they implied a huge population growth. But is it uh, as unavoidable as it seems? Our, uh, our modeling uh, 
shows the negative answer to this question. And uh, oh, probably here it's better. So uh, here we can compare the US scenario with the scenario of uh, where secondary education enrollment grows by 3% annually. Uh, and the difference is rather huge, but it's even greater when uh, mass female education is accompanied by a, uh, introduction of effective family planning campaigns. And uh, here we have the Tanzanian population increase for, uh, to about uh, 80 million of people instead of uh, 150. So the, uh, so the population explosion in tropical Africa is still avoidable but uh, the action must be very concentrated and it must include only the most effective measures because uh, the time uh, does not allow to experiment with the non-effective measures. So the most, uh, the greatest priority uh, seems to be the introduction of uh, seems to pr be prioritizing the female secondary education and introduc introducing uh, not only compulsory primary education but also aiming to introduce compulsory secondary education as soon as possible. But uh, uh, while this measure is a long-term measure, uh, the reintroduction of effective family planning campaigns is also necessary. So. Uh, The combination of long-term measures, which is universal compulsory secondary education, and shorter-term measures, which is massive uh, family planning promotion, it's costly, but uh, it seems to be the only uh, possible scenario of avoiding the Malthusian-type risks and uh, just general socio-demographic collapses in tropical Africa in the future. So that's all. Thank you for your attention.